now as to what follows, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said on the occasion when Eid occurred on a Friday that two Eids have coincided on this day. Friday is a regular Eid and today the special day of Eid. He said those who have prayed the Eid prayer in the morning, uh, they do not need to return uh, for the, for the uh, usual Friday prayer. But we will have a prayer nevertheless. That means, as scholars understand, that the uh, prayer will be held in the masjid as usual. But those who have prayed the Eid prayer do not have to return for that afternoon prayer. You can pray Zohar wherever you happen to be. This is a ruksa, a facility given. I know many of the Muslims will say, I don't need that, I will come for the prayer because we love to come to the Jummah prayer. But I mention this in case somebody could not get the entire day off, you've already taken the morning off, you, you, if you have to go back to work, this is allowable in, in our religion according to the opinion of many scholars. Some others will disagree, but in many issues you have disagreement among the scholars because some things appear to be very clear, some things depend on some interpretation. This is one of those uh, things. Uh, I'm handed a note saying that we will have a gifts uh, and balloons for the children downstairs and near the kitchen. So stay with me, let's finish this lecture. I won't keep it too, uh, too long. And then you can take the children down to have some uh, gifts and balloons on the lower floor, inshallah. Uh, so now, as for the content of this khutbah, very quickly, because the Pan Am games are going on at the moment, I thought it would be appropriate for us to think about what games and sports actually remind us about religion in general and about our own religion in particular. Uh, according to uh, the uh, latest count I'm familiar with, uh, Canada has scored uh, 38 uh, gold medals, uh, 36 silver medals, and uh, 23 bronze medals. So we would like to say Alhamdulillah for Canada. And uh, to our online uh, viewers, I hope you wouldn't mind if I cheer for my country in such a competitive uh, spirit, uh, provided that this is something that does not harm anyone else. Uh, as you might not, not normally cheer for your country as well. Now this is healthy competition, it makes us uh, better. So now to organize this, uh, our thoughts in this khutbah, uh, I, I want to uh, make five brief points and I will relate each one of the points to one of the letters that spell the word games in English. So how do we spell games in English? Help me out here kids. So we go G A M E Yes, okay. So, uh, I will also try to incorporate some suggestions I have from Muslim leaders. I sent out uh, a week ago an email to the uh, Muslim leaders list uh, that circulated to Imams and other activists, especially in the GTA, and I've got some suggestions which I'd like to incorporate. So I'll tell you as I go along what are these suggestions and how you'll see how they're incorporated. So now, for the first letter, we're at the G, right? So G, I would say, is for goals. Setting goals and achieving them. That's very important in games, right? Without setting a goal, uh, you, you can't achieve anything. So somebody wants to train for, for the games. So you have a goal. I, I have to be able to achieve this, uh, whatever, speed or strength uh, or, or accuracy. Uh, you set a goal for yourself and then you practice and then you know when you've gotten there. If you don't set a goal for yourself, how will you know if you've achieved it? How will you know if you're ready for the games or not? In a similar way, in Islam, we need to set goals for ourselves. We need to say to ourselves, look, so far 
I, 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 I've been coming only for the uh, Eid prayer, but uh, I, I haven't been praying the rest of prayers. How about if I give prayer a trial in my life? How about if I do one prayer a day? If somebody has not prayed at all, and we say, okay, just pray one prayer a day, but set that as a goal for yourself. And say every day now, at least Isha prayer before I go to bed, I, instead of watching the 11 o'clock news, I'll pray the one prayer. My brothers and sisters, I promise you that once you start praying that regularly, you will feel the, 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 the pleasure of praying. And, and you will feel the attachment to prayer. Then you can add another one. Maybe you'll say in the morning before going out to work, I'll pray my Fajr even if it is late. But I'll pray it. And then, when I come back home from work, why wait for the late night, late night prayer? Why not pray the earlier one as well, the Maghrib? And so you will keep adding. And eventually you find yourself doing all five. And eventually comes a time when you cannot see yourself not doing it at all. You, you cannot not do it after a while. Because that has become so much a part of you, you feel that attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you do not want to give that up. So you need to set some goals. That be between now and the next aid, which is only two months and ten days away, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing one prayer per day, every day, at least the late night prayer, or whichever one is convenient for you. If you're doing three already, make it a fourth. If you're doing four, make it all five. So set a goal for yourself between now and then. So goal setting. Achieving the goal is also uh, very important. And one gets a pleasure from achieving the goal. You know you've set that goal, you've worked towards it, you've achieved it. How do we feel after we fasted all Ramadan? We feel good, right? Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us that benefit. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi is reported to have said that the believer who fasts in Ramadan feels two moments of joy. One is the joy felt at the end of the day when breaking the fast. And uh, two is the joy felt when meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we will feel that joy. That's a goal we set for ourselves in the morning. We said we're not going to eat or drink until evening. And we maintain that goal. And now we achieve it. With that achievement comes the exhilaration. We feel that happiness that we have achieved that goal. So that's the first letter. So that's the G of games. Then we go to what? The A. The A, I would say, is for attentiveness. Attentiveness. If you're playing any one of these sports, you have to pay attention. And not because somebody might cheat you, but if you don't keep your eye on the ball, you lose it. You, you have to be aware of what is going on. What do we have to do in our prayer? We have to keep our attention. What do we have to do in our fasting? We have to keep our attention. Why? Because you're fasting, you want to make sure you don't eat or drink by mistake or by forgetfulness. By the way, if you were fasting and you ate forgetting that you were fasting, this can easily happen the first couple of days because you're accustomed to eating habitually and uh, without thinking you just ate something, right? But that, that's where the attentiveness is needed. But if it so happens that you ate something in forgetfulness, according to a hadith, it is Allah who fed you and gave you something to drink. And that fast still counts as a valid one. So long as you stop eating or drinking at the moment you remember. See, the grace and bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But naturally, we need to keep our attention on the fast, not only to avoid the eating and drinking, but to avoid backbiting and slandering and foul language and cheating and lying and, and, and dishonest behavior in general while we are fasting. So that calls for attentiveness. You have to keep your mind on what you're doing. I'm fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody tries to pick an argument with you. According to the hadith, you should say to that person, I am fasting, which means... Uh, hands off. I'm not going to get into this, no wrangling, because I'm devoting myself to the worship of my Lord. I'm not going to get into any fights or quarrels with anybody. That's attentiveness. If you go to make the Hajj, which will come about in two months from now, as some people may be going from here, you have to be attentive in what you're doing in the Hajj. So when we think about the games, and we think of, of what the games require, we realize that that is something important in our religion as, as well. Now we go to the M. I have to move on quickly, right? I read the M here, kids. Yeah, M. Okay, so G A M. Okay, the M. I would say is for modeling and uh, mentorship. Uh, one of the uh, uh, comments I got and, and suggestions for what is to be said in the in the Eid khutbah is from a sister in Edmonton, Alberta. 
Uh, she wrote to me saying that uh, uh, we need to focus more on the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as a mentor and as a role model. Now, when we think about mentorship in the games and, and, and modeling, we realize that a, a game is not something you learn only by reading about it. There are important players out there who have excelled at what they do, and we want to copy them, we want to be like them. I remember when I was a kid growing up in Guyana, before I learned how to read, I used to be eager to receive the, the Daily Chronicle and the, the, the Daily Mirror, uh, the, the newspapers which were being circulated at that time in, in Guyana. I, I didn't know how to read. Why did I want to get the newspapers? Because I want to see the cricketers. I want to see their new pose. You know, I like the way they swung the bat. You know, maybe the bat is being swung that way. Maybe the guy is dropping on his knees and then he, you know, he slams the ball. Uh, so I, I like that. So what are we doing? We're looking at these models and we're saying, okay, these are the great guys. I want to be like that guy. And, and you know, maybe some of you will know the names of Rohan Kanai and Kali Charan and so on. These were the names that excited me. I want to see these players. I want to know their scores. So we're looking up to somebody who has done it well. If you want to serve Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, what do we do? We look up to somebody who has done it well. Who has done it the best? Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran itself says, "Lakad kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasana liman kana yarju Allah wal yom al akhira wa dakar Allah kathira." In the Messenger of Allah is the best example for those who look forward to their meeting with Allah on the last day and they remember Allah much. So we need to take the Prophet ﷺ as our role model. The sister from Edmonton was saying we need to focus specifically on the Prophet ﷺ as a human being in his environment relating civically with his uh, society. And this is something that is not stressed enough. As we have a counselor here present, it is even more appropriate uh, that we highlight uh, and, and remember this important aspect of our, uh, uh, our presence here in Canada. We should be engaged civically. I also have a similar message from Sister Amira uh, with the National Council for Canadian Muslims. She said that I should uh, let the youth know that if you will turn 18 by the next election, you should register to vote. So how many of you will turn 18 by the next election? How many of you will turn 18 by the next election? Uh, there is somebody here, a sister there, mashallah. Uh, so make sure you're registered to vote. Your vote counts. You may be thinking one little vote is not going to change anything. It's not your one little vote alone, but it's your one little vote added to millions of other little votes that actually make a difference. That's why uh, some city officials and other politicians should want to come and meet with Muslims to find out what uh, Muslims are interested in. What makes you tick? What are your concerns? So that these concerns can be addressed at the appropriate levels. Because when it comes time to cast your vote, naturally your votes will be cast in favor of those, uh, um, of those authorities and forces uh, and, and, and persons who will in some way work towards the achievement uh, of those things which are important to you as Muslims. So yes, we need to be civically engaged. We need to take responsibility for what's happening in our country and be engaged and make sure that it is happening in the best way possible. It's one of the reasons I'm talking about the games as well. Because when we look at the, at the models that are out there, uh, we see that something is wrong. In the daily papers, we see the photographers somehow have a fascination with showing those uh, athletes who are scantily dressed, whether men or women, and it seems that especially so the, the women. So why this? Couldn't we have fun in sports and games while being decently dressed? Why do we have to see semi-naked people, either as swimmers, uh, or, or performers of aerobics or gymna gymnastics and whatever. Are those going to be our role models? We have come a far way from you know, the batsman who swung his bat and, and fell on his knee and swung his bat and so on. Now we're daily uh, being treated. Uh, so I don't know what the, what the use. If, if, you know, when I was uh, a kid growing up, I was eager to get the papers to see Rohan Kanai and Kali Charan and, and their, their poses with their bats. But I don't know what, what the kids are doing nowadays. So what kind of society do we want to build? Do we want to build a society of individuals 
who are morally upright and, and who can do things of benefit to their society in the future? Or do we want to build a society of individuals who from a very young age are being fed things which can actually corrupt their minds? When we read in the papers about figures like Paul Bernardo and uh, Luca Magnata, people who have raped and killed and, and, and uh, they have cut up the bodies of women to pieces, in, in one case, buried them, you know, encased them in concrete and throw, threw them into the lake. Uh, what, what kind of individuals do we want to uh, train and develop in our society? If we want to develop morally upright individuals, we have to not only feed them the right foods, but also feed their minds with the right sort of things, right sort of ideas and images. So these images that we're seeing daily, yes, we celebrate because we have run, won the gold medals, 38 of them if you remember, and the 36 silver medals. But is this the way? Could we not uh, revamp sports as a worldwide phenomenon so that people become more conscientious? Yes, let's have fun, but in a decent way. And this is where Muslims can come in. And that's why Muslims need to excel in every field. So that Muslims can become the models. Muslims can become the mentors and teach other people to not only excel at what they do, but to also excel in moral issues as well. So now I must move on. So after the M, we are at the E. And E, I would say, is for, brace yourself because this is going to be a long word, endurance. Endurance. You kids know this word? Endurance. Endurance. What does endurance mean? Yeah, keep doing it. Endurance means that you can keep going. You, you, you have it in you and, and you continue to do that. So that's endurance. If somebody's going to excel at these games, uh, they have to have endurance. They can't stop in the middle. They, they, they need to keep going. So that means that they have to make sure that their bodies are strong, they're exercising well, they're eating right, and, and, and so on. What does our religion teach us? Actually, our religion teaches us to eat right, because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not only to eat halal, but eat halal and tayyibah. Eat that which is halal and wholesome. So when people are talking now about eating whole grains and whole foods and so on, that they're already speaking, they're speaking the Quranic language finally. Because the Quran already told us to eat that which is wholesome. So we go read the labels, we want to find out the fine things, you know, does it have monon, diglycerides and so on. Actually, uh, our scholars say that we don't have to go looking into these finer ingredients. Because two things have, uh, are, are to be borne in mind here. One is that those ingredients you're looking at are actually a very small part of the whole. It's negligible. And our religion is not so nitpicky with negligible things. It's about big things. So when, when we are told that pork is haram, yes, that's haram. It means you shouldn't grab a piece of pork and eat it. But if it so happens that a, a, a very tiny bit, negligible, is incorporated into a whole, you, can not, you're not, you cannot find it to remove it even if you wanted to remove it. So you just accept it as a matter of fact. You don't desire it. The Quran says, uh, whoever desires it, that's a different problem. You, you don't desire it as a Muslim, but you don't have to worry about it. That, that's the one thing because it's a negligible amount. The second thing is that that thing has now been transformed into a chemical substance. It's no longer meat. The meat is haram, but the chemical substance is not. Now listen carefully. I'm not saying that a Muslim should take a piece of pork and transform it because he likes to eat pork, but he's going to eat it in another form. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when somebody else has already transformed this into a chemical substance and put it into a food, then uh, you don't have to worry about that because the scholars say you're not actually eating the meat which is prohibited. Now it's a chemical substance which is not the same thing. And scholars explain this by giving examples. When a thing has changed its, its form and it's become something else, the ruling about it changes. Think about grapes. Can you drink, drink grape juice as a Muslim? Yes. Change that into wine. Can you drink the wine? No. Haram now, right? It was halal, it became haram. Change the wine into vinegar. Can you use the vinegar? Yes. 
So it's something new and different, it's not the original thing, the ruling changes according to what the thing is at the moment. In, 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 in logic, they say that there is a fallacy known as the genetic fallacy, where people treat the thing uh, based on what it originated as. And, and, and that's a fallacy in thinking. The, the important thing in this matter of eating is what is it now? Is it that prohibited meat or not? It is not, then it is permissible and so on. So we don't go to those fine ingredients, but look as a whole. We Muslims are very particular about those little nitty-picky ingredients. And what do we do? We swallow a whole lot of oil. We're still frying foods in this day and age. You see, our foreparents did not have better methods. The easiest thing for them was to fry, deep fry a lot of things. So all the pakoras and so on that are soaked in oil, and even the samosas, that's what they've been consuming. But eventually they clog our arteries. So what do we do now? Let's switch. Let's go to baking, boiling, steaming, grilling. We have these methods available, why not use this? This is what is meant by halal and tayyibah. Eat halal and eat good. So we need to eat uh, uh, right, we need to exercise well, because we need endurance. Those who will go to the, make the hajj, they know we need endurance. Uh, you will have to make uh, tawaf seven times. You have to make sa'i back and forth between the two hillocks. So you need endurance. You don't want to like stop in the middle, right? So you need to make your, keep your body strong, you need to endure. So now we've done the E, where are we now? At the S. S, that's the last letter of games. And I would say that the S is for sustainability. 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 All right, a big word again, but uh, sustain means to maintain, to keep. It's almost like endurance, but now I'm gonna look at it from a different angle. Sustainability means you have to be able to continue. Let's say you're running a race. You're running a race, you don't start off like uh, at, at maximum speed, exhausting yourself, and then in the middle you crop out, you can't finish the race. You need to get to the finishing line, right? In order to get to the finishing line, you have to go at a moderate pace, but a sustainable pace, so that you can reach the end. Now let's think about sustainability. We have come out of Ramadan, right? Now we need al istikama steadfastness. We need that sustainability. We need to continue the race. We can't crop out now. Ramadan is done and now we, we are without energy. We can't do anything more now. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said that a small uh, bit of deed but done consistently is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a sudden spike and then, you know, nothing. So, do it consistently. Whatever good you can do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do it consistently. If you can read one page a day of the Quran before going to work, make that your habit and do it consistently. If you can't read a page, uh, read one verse. That can be your, your task for the day. Before I rush out of the house, keep the Quran in the, like near the breakfast table or on the breakfast table. Uh, very quickly, read one verse, then go. Eventually you'll finish reading the whole Quran if you do it consistently. Some of the scholars say, if you cannot even read, just look at the page, because that itself is an act of devotion. You're, you're admiring the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just looking at it, that too, an act of devotion. Well, my hope is that by looking at the page, eventually you'll start being curious and say, what is that word? Okay, let me read that. And, and then you will read a, a, a verse, and then two verses, then three verses, then eventually you're reading the whole page, and so on. Uh, so, uh, sustainability, make sure you can do it. A lot of times, uh, more generally now, in the bigger picture, uh, the, the way in which we have thought about Islam is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. We have to transform uh, and this, this message of Islam uh, in order to transmit it to our next generation. We, do, we don't need to change it from the original but we need to transform it back to what it was in the original. Imam Malik rahimahullah is noted to have said that nothing will fix this ummah, this nation, except that which fixed it from the beginning. And what has happened with us, and we don't realize, is that there have been a couple of hundred years of Islam evolving before it became in its, in its form that everybody knows. Everybody now has an idea of Islam. If you grew up in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, uh, or even me in Guyana looking at what we knew to be Islam, you have an image in your mind of what Islam is, with all of its parts fitting together. To you, this is Islam. 
Now you come to Canada, you see Muslims from various parts of the world. Some are praying with their hands going up every time they come up from Ruku. Some are saying Amin aloud, some are saying it silent, as, and, and so on. So you see that there is a different form now. So what has happened? What has happened is that over the first 300 years of Islam, the scholars have been interpreting and explaining the details to people. Various scholars explain these dif details differently and their explanations solidified in different parts of the world. Those who grew up in those parts of the world, that's all they knew. And they thought that this and only this is the religion. Then they come to Canada and they become surprised because somebody else is praying in a different way. Maybe you pray in, in another part of the world. If you're without a cap, somebody will bring a cap and put it on your head. But you, you come and you see that there are people from another part of the world, they're very devout, but they don't wear a cap to pray. So now you realize that it, it cannot be an essential part of our religion, because how could it be an essential part of our religion and half the world doesn't know about it? The essential parts of our religion are first of all stated in the Quran, that's most essential. Then they are stated in the authentic hadith related from the Prophet wasallam. that's also essential. And these are known to our scholars worldwide. But when there is a difference of opinion because something is not very clear, that's when people have interpreted it one way or another way, and these interpretations have solidified. So Islam has now transformed over the first 300 years until reaching its final form. But, but that's not a final form. That's how it has been so far. For us to transmit this to the next generation, we need to transform this back to the way it was in the original. The original flexibility and applicability of Islam and the time of the Prophet ﷺ, that's what we need to regain. Now we are in a situation where many of our youth are agitated because what they know to be Islam does not seem to be practical, it does not seem to be applicable in our present circumstances. This is one of the reasons why some of our youth are turning to extremism and to violence in the name of Islam because what they know to be Islam is not working for them to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they think they have to destroy the world and destroy the non-Muslims in order to make everything pure for Allah the way they conceive Islam to be but their conception is wrong actually Islam is very flexible and practical and applicable anywhere but we haven't seen that applicability and flexibility and rationality because we have conceived of Islam in its developed form after 300 years. When were the books of hadith written? In the third century of Islam. Where do most of the details of Islam come from? From the books of hadith. If you want to regain that flexibility, we have to go back to the earliest stages of hadith. Even among the books of hadith, you will see that there is the development. If you read Bukhari and you read Ibn Majah, you will see there's a lot of difference between Bukhari and Ibn Majah. Even if you read Bukhari and Abu Dawood, you'll see there's a lot of difference between Bukhari and Abu Dawood. What's the main difference? The transformation over time. The, the, the more time passes, the more people are inventing things and attributing them to the Prophet ﷺ. The more they are making changes to the original narratives. To find the earliest ones, we have to go back as early as possible. We have to even go beyond Bukhari to the Muwatta of Imam Malik rahimahullah. Because that's, this was written in the 2nd century. Imam Bukhari's hadith book written in the 3rd century. Mawatta, 2nd century. So we go earlier. We go to the earliest tafsir books, to the earliest biographies of the Prophet ﷺ. We see how things were before they got to be transformed. So we see now where we have to take it back to. We have to take it back to the Messenger of Allah to reclaim the flexibility, the rationality, the applicability of Islam. The reasonableness that will make a youth look at it and say, yeah, I didn't realize it was so easy. I didn't realize it was so flexible. I didn't realize it was so practical. I didn't realize that Islam made so much sense. Let me go tell the world about Islam. Instead of destroying the non-Muslims, you should be inviting them to Islam. And, and, and we can only do that if we ourselves are convinced that Islam is rational and we can easily make sense to a person who is willing to listen. But if we think the person is not going to listen, be either because the person is irrational or because what we are presenting is irrational, then we think no need to give them the message, just destroy them because they're going to be destroyed anyway in the life hereafter. Some of our youth are guilty of that. Let us now transform this community, calling this community back to Allah and His Messenger to reclaim that original rationali rationality and uh, flexibility of Islam. Because only in that case will Islam be sustainable. 
Only in that case can we transmit this religion to the next generation. Otherwise you will find brothers and sisters that the next generation is leaving Islam. The young girls do not want to wear the traditional Muslim uh, clothing. Uh, the young boys do not want to stay away from dating and, uh, and befriending, befriend, befriending girls uh, and, and even engaging in uh, certain activities before marriage, whereas they should wait for marriage. So they will say no uh, to these rules. Why? Largely because they are finding that Islam, as we are presenting it to, it to them, is not reasonable. Too many restrictions, too many obligations. If all of these come from Allah and His Messenger, we say, Sami'ana wa ta'ana, we hear and we obey. But if these restrictions and obligations are not coming from Allah and His Messenger, but were added by other people later on, in the first 300 years of Islam, then we need to go back beyond that and say, okay, uh, that was said, that was nice, that was for a certain reason, but we need to go back beyond that. That's one of the reasons why we have removed that lattice partition that used to block off the sister's area. Because in my studies, I, it became very, very clear to me, and so far nobody is able to dispute this, because it is so clear, that in the masjid of the Prophet, peace be upon him, there was no physical barrier between the men and the women. I say it again, in the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, and I mean in his time, because I have to add now in his time, because recently a lady said to me, but now we go to the Medina masjid, in the masjid in Medina, that's the Prophet's masjid, and there is a separated section for women. Yes, that's nowadays. So what people are doing nowadays is not what I'm asking about. Nowadays there are some people who say that women cannot drive cars in some countries. I'm not speaking about that. These are all things that people have added of their own, with their own best judgment. They could be great scholars, but that's what they think, for good reasons or bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And I think they're doing it for good reasons and honest and sincere and wanting to serve the religion and so on. But it's a wrong ruling. The, the right thing is to go back to the Prophet ﷺ and see that in his time, there was no physical barrier between the men and the women in the masjid. We cannot be more pious than the first generation. So let's not invent something and make that a barrier in the minds of people. So that if, uh, if a city councillor comes here or, or uh, some other uh, woman comes here, it could be a young woman who will be turning 18 before the election, a young Muslim girl who is not accustomed to this. She just came out to the Eid prayer for the first time in the masjid. She just wanted to check it out because she hadn't been there before. And now this becomes like a barrier in her mind and she thinks, no, this religion is not for me. I don't really feel at home here. So we don't want to put barriers in front of the, uh, the people from entering or, or embracing this religion. Let us go back to the way it was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So that way it will be sustainable. If we just keep it the way it was for the last few hundred years, that I tell you my brothers and sisters is not sustainable. And we're seeing the numbers. If you use the internet as I do, you will realize that there's a large segment of the Muslim population that does not come to the masjid anymore. Some have started a movement called the Unmasked Movement. Unmasked. That, meaning that they used to be in the masjid, but no, not anymore. They don't want to go back there. Not because they're lazy. Maybe they are, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We don't know what's in the minds of people. But they're saying that the masjid has this, this, and that other problem. One of the problems they're saying is that the women's area are usually blocked off. It's usually a smaller area. It's constricted. It's narrow. Uh, it's poorly lighted. Uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so let us not make more people join the unmasked movement. Let's welcome them and show them this is how it was in the time of the Prophet Wasallam. You are welcome. Let there be free and open space. Let there be space for people to breathe. But at the same time, we strike a balance. Neither on one extreme nor the other. One extreme, total segregation. The other extreme, total mixing. Balance in between. There is some segregation, but not a complete blockade that becomes now a barrier in the minds of people. Let's strike a balance in this and other affairs. So now to recap very quickly and let's end this now. So there were five points, right? Five points. What were the five points? They were linked to the letters of the word that, uh, of the word game, right? So we started with which letter? G. G was for what? Goals. And uh, so setting them and achieving them. A was for what? Attentiveness. You guys are paying attention. Yes. And uh, the the M was for 
modeling and, and mentorship, right? Uh, taking our Prophet Sallallahu as a model. The E was for that big word, what was it? Endurance. Even some of the small kids know this, mashallah. And the S for? Sustainability. So let us uh, go away with this message today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us our prayers, our fasting, and all of our good works during the month of Ramadan. We ask you, Ya Rabbul Alameen, to accept from us our humble prayer today and this uh, khutbah and the time we have spent here, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Allahumma ghfir lana wa likwana na lidin sabakuna bil iman. Wa la tajal fi kulubina ghilla lil ladina amanu. Rabbana inna karu ufur rahim. Allahumma ghfir lana mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum al amwat. إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم أعيد الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر من نصرين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعلنا منهم ربنا لا تدع لنا ذما إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أعيد علينا رمضان أعواما عديدة وأزمنة مديدة Oh Allah, we ask you to make uh, every good thing for us at the end, Ya Rabb. Make the last of our lives, uh, the, the last years, the best of them. The best of our deeds, make them the, the see, that which caps the deeds, Ya Rabb al oh Allah, make the, our best day the day that we meet you, Ya Rabb. Oh Allah, we ask you to accept from us our fasting and everything during the month and help us to sustain that in the months that follow and, and in the year that follows, Ya Rabb al -Alamin. Oh Allah, we ask you, La tuzikulubana ba'da idh hadaytana وهب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك إنك أنت أنت الرحمن الرحيم يا رب العالمين. Oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Rabb, to forgive our sins. ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين. Oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Rabb. To bless the children who are here, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Make them ulama and khufad and qurra. Make them leaders uh, of the next generation, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you to bless the Masjid Expansion pro Project, Ya Rabb. Oh Allah, let this be a dream come true, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you to bless the donors, accept their sadaqat, Ya Rabb, and build for them that house in paradise that is promised in that uh, noble hadith, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Uh, oh Allah, we ask you to accept from us this humble dua. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وآخر دعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين. Finally, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. إيد مبارك تقبل الله منا وإنكم كل عام وأنتم بخير وأنتم بالصحة والسلامة. Those of you who are watching us on the web, السلام عليكم. إيد مبارك تقبل الله منا ومنكم. السلام عليكم.